chapter 66. Shout with joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Come, let us rejoice in him. Let the sound of his praises be heard. Would you stand and we sing together this morning hymn number seven, which will also be on the screen behind me. Hymn number seven, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Would you stand? this morning to worship you, the giver of life, the giver of joy, and the giver of love. And Father, as we celebrate this morning the dedication of a child back to you, as we commission one to become a deacon of the church, Father, we know that all good and precious things come from you. So we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the lives that you have touched. Father, for the fellowship and the family that we have. We give you thanks. We ask that you would be among us this morning. That we would lift up the name of Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Derek and Abby, it's you and Jacob, you all would come forward. As Keith said in his prayer, what a joyful day this is in our church family as we're having a, a child uh, dedicated. And Jackson, I forgot you. You want to be a part of this too, I'm sure. <laughs> and so what, a, what an exciting time. Church family, today, uh, Derek and Abby are bringing forth and acknowledging and professing their dependence on the Lord to raise their child, uh, Jacob, into the family of God. They're, they're going to raise him, uh, acknowledging that he is Lord, and so whenever he is ready, he will accept the Lord. It's what a wonderful thing to dedicate uh, children to the Lord. And we're going to go through some vows then at this time. So, uh, Derek, Abby, do you come professing Jesus Christ as the Lord and the Savior of your lives? 
Yes, we do. And do you dedicate yourselves to biblical instruction, discipline, and love of Jacob? Yes, we do. And do you come to dedicate Jacob into the ultimate control and the will of God through the Lord Jesus Christ? We do. All right. A church family, do you agree to support these families, these, these parents, <laughs> by your example? Let me just do that again. Do you, church family, agree to support these parents by your example? And through acts of service, and do you agree to reinforce the biblical instruction, the discipline, and the love of this child under the supreme rule of the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you do, I would ask you to signify by standing. And now... So happy. <laughs> I figured the minute that I picked him up, he might not be, but he is such a happy baby. So, Jacob, it is my honor at the wishes of your family and your extended church family to dedicate you to God. And we'll dedicate you right now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you, I just thank you for this family. I thank you for their willingness to dedicate their child, their children, to you. And Father, we just ask that we can come alongside of them to help and to support them and to teach them the ways of the Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Here's a baby bag. But I have something to give to both of you here. probably no single greater song that we've all learned growing up in the church than Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so would you sing with me children. The choir actually sang this uh, almost three years ago for Jackson's baby dedication. So today we want you to join us and sing with us. I'm going to ask you to stand. The words will be on the screen, but if you want to see the music, it's hymn 508, Lord, for the gift of children.
children will be leaving for a children's church at this time. But I did want to say welcome to all of you. I know we have a lot of extended family here today to celebrate with Derek and Abby, so welcome. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And we will begin in verse number 10 and look at it through verse 17. A familiar passage. And today we're going to look at how Jesus, how he has taught us how to minister. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place, belonging to the city called Bethsaida. And when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had a need of healing. And when the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country, lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and twelve baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you right now, and we are going to examine your word and prepare even for the ordination of one of the men that's being set aside in this church. And we have just celebrated the dedicating of a child to you. Father, our, let our hearts be full. Let us focus on your words. Let the Holy Spirit apply them to our lives. And Father, may we all renew our commitment to you on this special Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. So as we ordain a new deacon later in this service, I think it's very appropriate that we look at the scripture of Jesus teaching how to minister. Now Jesus once said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And so it is with the Lord's disciples. Now if you look at the, uh, the slide, if you can see it very well. It's a little smaller than I intended it to be. You'll see Jesus teaching, and that's what he did throughout all of his ministry, teaching, healing the sick. If you looked on the front of your bulletin, you saw a stained glass that we have that shows Jesus as a child with a family. I thought that was appropriate with the dedication of a child, and I thought Jesus teaching since he was teaching, the, the scriptures teach us how to minister. I thought that was appropriate. So I just wanted to point those two things out. Number one, Jesus demonstrated and taught the need for privacy. If you're going to minister, you need to have privacy. You need to have rest. And we'll look at verses 10 through 11 as we examine that. The first sub point is an evaluation process is needed for ministry. Look at what it says in verse 10. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. The setting, remember, is that the 12 disciples had been sent out. They had been sent out on mission to proclaim the kingdom of God, and they were coming back, and they were reporting to Jesus at this time. Jesus needed to discuss with them the mission trip that had just happened. Why? Because he needed to evaluate their strengths 
and he needed to also encourage them in their weaknesses. You see, Jesus had been involved in his public ministry up to this point, healing the sick, proclaiming the kingdom of God to the crowds of people. But as he was beginning to come near to the end of his earthly ministry, now he was going to concentrate more and more on the disciples themselves. He was going to pour himself into them in this last phase of the ministry because he wanted to intensely train them to carry on the word to establish the church. Jesus had sent them out on this very first mission trip. Now he wanted to evaluate them. Now, when I was in the business world, we, we evaluated everything. We followed the military model, and, and earlier I had spent some time in the military. Uh, you had an after-action report for those of you that were in the military. And maybe in your business you do the same thing. Why? Because you do some things well, and you do some things that you need to do better. That's the whole point of evaluating. Well, the same thing needs to take place within the church. Now, for our staff, and we have a relatively small ministry staff, uh, it's uh, Keith and I, and then Lisa's our assistant. I mean, there's just three of us right now, but we do have an annual evaluation process for them. The challenge, the challenge is always, how do you effectively uh, evaluate uh, volunteers? Well, this weekend we had a, a deacon a training time and an evaluation time where we could look at the deacon ministry periodically. We do the same thing in Sunday school. We'll have the leaders come together and we'll evaluate and maybe we can do some things different or better. In fact, one of the last times we did that, we decided to join some of our adult Sunday school classes and try to also reach out with Zoom, just trying some different things to reach more people. But how do you continue to do this? Well, the next step point is the disciples need to evaluate themselves in the presence of God. And that's, that's what's critical. It's always in the presence of God. Continuing on in verse 10, it says, Then he took them, and he went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. Both the disciples, their bodies, and definitely their spirits, they were, they were exhausted. They were physically, they were spiritually just drained. So what did Jesus do? Well, he took them and he went to a deserted place. He went to it in a nearby city. And Jesus was doing that so he could get them alone privately into this deserted place. It says that it talks about they wanted to be a quiet place and they wanted to be in a deserted place. It's mentioned twice in this passage. I doubt that they actually entered into the city. They were just giving us the city for where it was, but they were. They probably went to a deserted place outside of the city for the purpose of evaluating their mission trip. So the point is made. There's a time for the ministry and there's a time, a quiet time, for evaluating the ministry and evaluating yourself. See, there's also that time when you need to renew your body and your spirit. Remember, anyone involved in ministry should be evaluating the ministry and also giving yourself rest and being in the Lord. It's important. Don't just go away from the ministry, but get along with God. Because he will reveal things to you. And he will teach things to you. It's so important to get alone with God in order to be renewed in your spirit and body. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. This is what Jesus said. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And what will he do? I will give you rest. So it's important to be restored. Next sub point is that Jesus allowed the needs the needy, excuse me, the needy to interrupt the much needed privacy. Listen to what it says. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him and, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those people that need, had need of healing. 
The people followed Jesus. Remember, Jesus had taken the twelve. He had tried to go alone into a deserted place. And what happened? The people followed. What did Jesus do? He received them. You see, he didn't put up a sign saying, we're out on a corporate retreat. You cannot come in. I, I said that. I knew Keith would chuckle because we've talked a lot. There seems to be so many today in the church that think that the ministers and pastors are supposed to be the CEOs. And Keith and I happen to believe we're supposed to be here to minister, to minister. That's what Jesus is showing us. People followed him and he received them. Uh, understand this crowd of people was interrupting the disciples need for privacy they were interrupting their need for rest and for spiritual renewal they had been the, the disciples had been out ministering to the people they were doing all that they could do and, and yet here they were demanding more well unfortunately in a minute we'll see that the disciples were rather rude to the people but Jesus was filled with compassion for the people you see the disciples were learning from Jesus they yes they needed to rest but what they really needed was compassion they needed compassion for the people Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10 says whatever your hand finds to do do it with your might for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. To me, that seems to be saying we need to be working when it's now. When it's now. Now's the time. Now's the time. Uh, later on, Jesus said, you know, we need to work while it's light. Right? The darkness is coming. We need to work while it's light. Second main point then for how he taught Jesus met both spiritual and he met physical needs. And we'll look at verses just the end of 11 and then through 13. Jesus met both spiritual and physical needs. The first subpoint is Jesus preached the kingdom of God. Listen, he said he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus taught us a valuable lesson. He was meeting the physical needs of the people, but he was also meeting the spiritual needs of the people. The people needed both. They didn't need someone just coming and preaching to them. They needed someone who would minister to their physical needs as well. I think so many churches and unfortunately so many people, they become focused that we've got to help We've got to meet needs of people. We've got to be there for them. We've got to meet the needs. We've got to meet those physical needs. But Jesus taught physical needs are important, but always couple them with a presentation of the life-changing gospel. Amen? Amen? We must never forget the gospel. For ministers, and that, by the way, is every Christian. We are all ministers. 2 Timothy 4, 2 is an important verse. Preach the word, be ready in season, and out of season convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Always be ready to proclaim the word of God. Second step one is that Jesus healed those who had a need of healing. You see, that's the truth of God's word. A believer who a believer who really needs healing is going to be blessed by God and he is going to be healed. I want you to please note the need of healing is not always the greatest need in a person's life. You understand that? It's not always the greatest need. God sometimes uses a physical need in a person's life so that they will then reach out and be filled with what? Not physical healing, but a spiritual healing where the glory of God is revealed to that person. We need to understand that not everyone is going to be physically healed. Sometimes what we need is that we need to learn love. We need to learn joy and peace and endurance. And, and prayer, meaningful prayer. And we need to trust 
And we need to have faith. And we need to have hope through all suffering. You see, Jesus always heals those in need of healing. Whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, or whether it's both. David Jeremiah, if you're familiar with him, he wrote a book a few years ago called A Bend in the Road. This was at a time when he was dealing with cancer that he had in his life. And he shared this prayer in that book, and that has meant so much to me. I've adopted it as my prayer. I give it to you. Uh, listen, this is what he said. It's just simply this. He said, Lord, what do you want to teach me to make me a better person? What do you want to teach me to make me a better person? What are your plans to make me more effective? Lead me and guide me through the process. Oh, Lord, be my teacher. Show me your ways. And do not let me miss any lesson you have prepared for me. Amen. I have seen, and probably you have too, way too many people focus on being physically healed. Oh, if I could just be physically healed. And, and their spirits, folks, they need to be healed also. Jesus Christ focused on both. Acts 10, 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing and all who were oppressed by the devil. Why? For God was with him. That's what we need. Every single one of us. We need to have a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit and we need to know that God is with us. Amen? Third uh, subpoint is the wrong attitude was then illustrated by the disciples. I love this passage because it, it's such a teaching passage. The wrong attitude. That's what you get from the disciples. Look what it says. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and they said to him, Send the multitude away that they might go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions. For we are in a deserted place. All day long, Jesus had preached to the people. He healed those that needed to be healed. And now, nighttime was approaching. And the disciples were tired. And they suggested to Jesus, why don't you just dismiss this crowd? And let them take care of their own personal needs. We need to keep in mind something. The disciples hadn't invited that crowd in. Who did? Jesus did. This was supposed to be the disciples' day. I'm not doubting them. They were supposed to be alone with Jesus. They were supposed to be resting, being spiritually renewed, evaluating their mission trip. But the point is, the disciples, they didn't have any sense of what personal responsibility for the needs of the, of the crowd and the needs of the crowd where they needed, they were hungry. They had physical, they had spiritual needs. They weren't concerned. They just wanted them to go away. That's the wrong attitude to have in ministry. The correct attitude was shown by Jesus. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. Now, understand that in the Greek, that word you, humes, that's emphatic. You give them something to eat. Those disciples were supposed to take care of the people's need. They were to feed them. They were to minister to them physically and spiritually. They weren't supposed to leave them to be to themselves. That was important. Jesus knew these people needed to hear the gospel. He knew that they had physical needs that needed to be ministered to. And he needed more than just to be sent out to get bread. Remember that whenever the, the devil, whenever Satan came to him and he tempted him to turn stones into bread, what did Jesus say? It is written, this is in Luke 4, 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Amen. Therefore, seeking spiritual things and ministering to the people's needs, 
That can be interrupted. I understand that sometimes it has to be interrupted, but only when it's necessary. John chapter 6, verse 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The next sub point is the problem was inadequate resources. They didn't have enough. It says here, they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. And, and then they added, unless we go and, and buy food for all these people and understand, I'm sure that Jesus and his 12 didn't have enough money to do that. So the disciples were, they were confessing to Jesus, we don't have enough. We just do not have enough food to take care of the needs of the people. This crowd was huge. This task was impossible. But I'll tell you something. The disciples did something right here, didn't they? They took their problem to Jesus. We're supposed to take everything to Jesus. They took their problem to Jesus. You see, the resources that the disciples had were inadequate to meet the needs of the people. However, they took what they had and they went to Jesus and they said, here's our solution. I mean, maybe we can go buy food, but we don't have enough money to do that. That wasn't the answer. What was important was they took the problem to the Lord. Luke 6, 38. This is what Jesus said. Give. And it will be given to you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over. Will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use. It will be measured back to you. Third point is that Jesus approached the needs in an orderly fashion. We'll look at verses 14 through 17. And that first sub point is organization was necessary for the needs to be met. For there were about 5,000 men, and then he said <coughs> to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50, and they did so, and he made them all sit down. Understand, this is a big problem for the disciples. There were 5,000 men. That doesn't count the women. That doesn't count the children. There could have been 10, 15,000. We don't know. Luke doesn't tell us. He just says there were 5,000 men, a very large crowd. The need was great. Uh, therefore, the organization was great. They needed to be organized in order to meet the people's need. And Jesus said, he used the disciples. He said, you go out there, you divide them, you put them into groups of 50 and have them sit down, groups of 50. So then... After using those disciples, dividing them into groups of 50, they were able to minister. Why? Why is that? Because it doesn't matter how small you may think that the, the well, let's just use our church, for example. <clears throat> you understand that if you were only going to have one person trying to do ministry to our church, that would be a huge task. So we have taken that, and, and after today, after we ordain our 10th deacon, we'll have our families divided among 10 different deacons. No more than six to eight families per person to look at. So now the task is becoming more manageable. The task is always enormous, and it can only be met in an orderly and organized fashion. Now question, where does the ministry often break down within a church? Well, it breaks down when people say, well, the pastor can take care of it, or the pastor and the staff can take care of it. That's not the answer. That's not possible. That's, Jesus didn't teach that. The, the deacons must minister, but it doesn't stop there. The Sunday school class must minister, but it doesn't stop there. Throughout the church, people must be ministering to others. Amen? It's got to be a total effort. 
Every step of the way, the ministry involves Christians being guided by the Lord, and they will then minister to their brothers and sisters in Christ. Next sub point is that Jesus looked to God in meeting the needs. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and he broke them, and he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. And so they all ate and were filled, and there were 12 baskets of leftover fragments taken up by them. Jesus, you see, looked up to God the Father to meet the needs of the people. Jesus looked up to heaven, giving thanks to God for what he had been given. Do you, do you see the true meaning here? He's showing us what blessing means when we bless our food. Jesus broke and he gave what he had. That was five loaves that had been given to him and two fish. And what was crucial about this? What's the point that he was making? Jesus was doing what he could looking to God the Father, giving thanks, and then he gave what he had to the people. He couldn't do any more. What about us? I think the lesson is very clear. Once we do our part, God will multiply the resources. God is the one who's in the miracle business and, and fulfills the ministry. Amen. Jesus utilized everything that was given to him. He was given five uh, loaves of bread and two fish, and he fed the people, and there was more than enough that they had leftovers. This was a miracle. I believe that with all my heart. Some people will say, well, everyone was just ashamed to bring out their food. No, I don't believe that. I believe it was a miracle that God, that Jesus, God the Son, looked up to God the Father. He blessed what he had, and he began handing it to the disciples to hand it out, and it just kept going, and it just kept going. And I've seen that happen over and over within the church and within different things when we really and truly give our hearts over to God. And when we really, truly are thankful and we really confess that we can't do it. But guess what? God can do it because he's in the miracle business. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes, I turn to that again. Chapter 11, verse 1, cast your bread upon the waters. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. I know that uh, some of you are probably saying at this point, I thought he was going to talk about ministry and he's trying to turn it into tithing. But I want you to know something. The two are not mutually exclusive. They're not. It's important to note that Jesus gave his disciples an impossible task. He gives us an impossible task. For them, it was feed, the, feed that large crowd. For us, it's minister. To, to what's becoming a, a much larger neighborhood. The fact is, Jesus always gives us an impossible task to perform for him. And why? Why is that? Because Jesus intends to do the work. Amen? Amen. It was this miracle, this feeding of the 5,000 was a miracle. I've told you that. Because God's in the miracle business. And when God reveals to us his plans for ministry... We need, to, we need to give our tithe of our money to the church. We also need to give of ourselves. We need, to, we need to give thanks to God for what he's provided to us. And when we minister as Jesus taught us, he will provide the means to accomplish the ministry. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's in all the fullness, the world." Those who dwell therein. Everything belongs to God. In just a moment now, the choir is going to minister to us in music. Please, I would ask you to respond to the calling of the Holy Spirit as the choir ministers to us at this time.
come up, please? What a wonderful, wonderful time in this church it is. If we are ordained, and Derek is one of our newest deacons today. So if you want to stand right here and I guess kind of face that, maybe like we're, we're trying to remember the camera, okay? So, so, so we got. I know we, we're doing this for a bigger audience than this here. Uh, and Derek, I'm just, I'm just, I'm glad. I mean, I've. I've watched Derek uh, grow. There was a time when the, the Lord uh, worked it out where we could get together. We were getting together each week, and we were, uh, you know, I just, I, I hate to use that word mentor, but we were just, we were working together, growing in the Lord, and it was great. And then it wasn't too long, then I saw uh, Derek and Abby uh, decide to join their lives together, and we had the privilege of doing that as a, church family, and then Jackson came along, and so we dedicated him, and then Jacob came along, and we dedicated him, and in the meantime, uh, the church has saw fit to elect Derek as a deacon. What a wonderful day this must be. Amen. <laughs> Deacons are ordained by the local church. And they exercise the general spiritual gifts of leadership and of ministry. You know, deacons assist the pastor, but it's so much more than that. I mean, they're there. They, they have to have, they have to meet the biblical criteria. Acts chapter 6 talks about the first deacons. Paul, the apostle Paul, talks about in 1 Timothy 3, the, the criteria that you have to meet. And then the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was characterized by his concern. We just looked at it today, by his concern for physical needs and spiritual needs, that we would meet them. And so, with that in mind, I'm going to give you a charge, and then we're going to go through the ordination process. And let me explain that we're doing that just a little bit differently uh, because of the because of the coronavirus, because of the pandemic. We're not going to go through individually and lay hands on Derek. Instead, we've had uh, several people. In fact, I've turned it open to the whole church to give cards, to get write a prayer, to write uh, whatever you want, encouragement, to to have a Bible verse, whatever you want. And Derek, you have those. They're going to be behind you. I'm going to give those to you as well as a certificate at the conclusion of this service. But I am going to call in just a moment. I'm going to call for the men to come forward. And when the men come forward, if you would just fill in, we'll do kind of a semicircle. And I'm going to ask Derek to kneel. I'm going to ask Abby to stand behind him because that's very appropriate. Our wives do uh, stand behind us and support us every bit of the way in our ministry. So I just wanted to let you know what was, you know, when I said we're doing the ordination, it's a little different than normal, but I think it's just as meaningful and it will be a blessing to you, my brother. Derek, this church has voted upon you an honor, a great responsibility. They selected you to be a deacon. Will you accept this responsibility and strive to fill that position to which you are called? And will you promote the interest of the church? Will you assist the pastor? Will you look out for the needs of the congregation and see that none shall suffer as far as your power is to prevent them? I will. And will you affirm your allegiance to Christ, the church, and the scriptures? I will. And will you accept the office of deacon in this church and promise faithfully to perform the duties required in this office? I will do so. And will you promise to cooperate with the pastor and to further the interest of this church in promoting its harmonious and effective working in all its ministries? I will. Congregation, I have a question for you. Will you, the members of the Damascus Baptist Church, acknowledge and affirm this brother as a deacon 
Will you esteem him, encourage him, and cooperate with him as he performs the duties of a deacon? Amen. Well, then I now charge you, Derek, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that you would strive to fill your office to the best of your knowledge, and that you will seek divine guidance in all your work. I'm going to ask Derek to kneel. Abby, if you'll come and stand behind him. All the ordained men in the church, I ask you to come. Uh, you may want to put your mask on, however you wish to do that. And I want you to stand here. And Pat and Jean, I want you to come up front. Jean, I want you to be in the pulpit because you're going to offer a prayer. So again, you guys, if you will, spread out. You can, you can be here. You can spread out this way, too. Uh, don't get hit now. What? I've never, never seen the men of the church want to hide like that over in the corner. You, you guys, be out here where we can be seen. Pat, I'm going to ask that you, or Jean, I'm going to ask that you would have the first prayer, if you would, please. And then, Pat, I'm going to ask you to close this in prayer. So if you would, everyone, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, our Lord, creator of all things, master of the universe, our heavenly Lord, we thank you for this day, a day in which we dedicate a child to you. Pray, Lord, that this child grow up to be the true servant of the Lord that you would have him be. And Lord, I pray that you be with Derek as he serves as a deacon of this church. I pray that you would teach him continually, that you grow him in you, and that you help him to help others grow in you. Lord, please bless his ministry to the families here at this church. We pray for your, your love, your mercy, your grace to abide with him and help it to flow through him to others. We love you, Lord. We appreciate you. We thank you for all you've done, for all you're going to do, for all you do for us each day. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. bringing Derek to this church to uh, just serve you in so many ways and uh, as he comes to this point in time and as he seeks to be that uh, deacon as he becomes that deacon that uh, let, let him follow as, let him continue to uh, pray so that he can be what uh, Paul talked about in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and let uh Abby also be that supporting spouse and, and let them support each other through prayer. Let the church support them as he so he can do his role of supporting this church and and be the deacon that uh, we all need. And we thank you for everything that he does and let the fellow deacons continue to support him so he grows and he helps us grow. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together? He's magnificent, this Jesus.
this morning in Sunday school, we talked about all the gifts that we have and how it affects all of us work together. And then David preached about that today, the unity and how all of us have a, a, a job and a, and a duty to, to serve the Lord and stuff. And, and today in our Sunday school class, somebody mentioned about, uh, you know, how today we seem more unified than we've been in years and years. And we're that way because of a couple of people. And, and these two people just celebrated birthdays this weekend. And, and David, when was your birthday? And, and you want to reveal how old you were? He, he had one of these milestone birthdays. He's a Medicare baby now. And, and Keith, when was your birthday? Yesterday. Yesterday. And, and, <laughs> what are you, 68? 60. 60. Oh, he had a better man. But anyway, I think we need to sing happy birthday. So, I can't sing a lick, so I'm not going to hear you. I'm going to lead it. Y'all lead it. Hell. 